thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, lovely evening. I hope everybody's staying well. Yes? Not hands. Thumbs up. Good, good. Um, who knows what what the next couple months is going to bring, but it's, uh, we always want to be careful and we want to make sure that we're safe and that we will have everybody available for the next few uh, Audubon uh, programs. So that would be great to have you back. Anyhow, um, welcome for this evening. Um, I think you're really going to enjoy tonight's program. Uh, it's, it's really exciting. I've been out to the Richfield Heritage Preserve and it's uh, again just a really really wonderful place uh, but I will let Corey talk a lot more about that. Um, you know our website I don't know how many of you have been to our website lately we've got so much happening as usual and we're going to be adding a lot more we not only have our members programs on the first Tuesday of each each month but we have virtual field trips we are going to be having some challenges, some birding challenges coming up in September and October. Uh, we are working on a, a uh, book club, so we maybe uh, uh, get a chance to talk with an author uh, on a book and then have a discussion. Um, there are just so many things and we hope that everybody can join in at some uh, way, shape or form in the near future. But another way to, to join in is to volunteer. Uh, if you're getting a little tired of being around home, uh, we can always use volunteers here at WCAS. Uh, it could be making phone calls, it could be um, helping to edit certain things, it could be writing something for the website or for a blog. So there's just a lot of things that, that people can do. So we'd like to hear from you at some time uh, at info at wcaudubon.org. That will get, get all of us, uh, the board members, we can all take a look at that uh, information and uh, get you involved. So we hope that you, you really do consider that. So uh, I guess uh, next will be Michelle, uh, who will be talking a, a little bit more about our bird walks and some field trips that we have had and have coming up. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. Um, so in-person activities, including our bird walks, continue to be canceled to reduce the spread of COVID-19. However, bird walk leaders are still going out to collect bird survey data for eBird. Bill Dininger and Dave Grass Kemper have been walking the Rocky River Nature Center trails for the sec the canceled second Saturday bird walks. Uh, the July second Saturday on the 11th started with a sprinkle of rain, but ended with the sun shining and all 40 species were tallied. Highlights include a red-tailed hawk mobbed by red-eyed vireos, a ruby-throated hummingbird, a scarlet tanager, and an American red start. And the, res the resident barred owl also made an appearance and they also saw a barn swallow feeding three young. And it was a treat for them to hear a pair of Viri singing very close by each other. So that sounded like a wonderful time and I am jealous that I missed it. <laughs> All right, so last month, last month kicked off our virtual field trip series. Eight participants visited Bath Nature Preserve, either independently or with a spouse, to bird or otherwise enjoy the natural space. Our target species were tree swallows and bobolinks, and although the bobolinks seem to have mostly moved on by July, we did have a few sightings. I am currently compiling the bird list, the journaling, and the photographs that were submitted to me into a digital scrapbook, and this will be ready by our virtual meetup for the event next week on Wednesday at 7 p.m. And even if you didn't have a chance to visit Bath Nature Preserve last month, you are still more than welcome to attend the virtual meetup in which I will share the scrapbook and we can talk about our experiences at the preserve if anyone has anything additional to share. And it doesn't have to be something that happened last month at Bath. It could be, you know, you, you went a couple years ago and saw something amazing. Maybe you got a lifer there. Um, please feel free to, to call in and we'll just have a conversation about Bath Nature Preserve. 
So August virtual field trip takes place at Portage Lakes Nemesilla Reservoir in search of purple martens. Uh, the best time to observe the purple martens is at dusk when they fly over the reservoir to prey on insects. Uh, during your visit, I encourage you to do any of the following activities. You can take photographs, uh, you can, well, maybe when you get home, you can draw a picture or create art inspired by what you saw. Um, you can tally identified species if there are more than just the purple martens out or uh, certainly try to count how many. That would be great. Um, you write down your thoughts, a journal, create a poem, a haiku, I'll write down any questions or curiosities about the target species or anything encountered at the location or to do with your experience. Uh, send any of these items to me and your contributions will be published to a digital scrapbook and shared on our website and on our social media platforms. Uh, we will also have an optional virtual meetup for that, that, that field trip um, to share our experiences and take a look at the scrapbook. And you can get more information and register for this virtual field trip by visiting yeah, our website, wcaudubon.org, and clicking the About Virtual Field Trips tile on the home page. And lastly, as you get out there to bird and enjoy nature during the pandemic, we encourage you to take precautions by staying six feet apart from others, not in your household, limit your group size, travel separately, wear a face mask and wash your hands or use a high alcohol hand sanitizer. Um, so yeah, as you're getting out there, maybe participating in the virtual field trip, uh, just be mindful that others are also there enjoying the space and uh, take these precautions to keep yourself and others safe. And that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, you know, I probably wouldn't have gone out to Bath Nature Preserve until Michelle said, hey, we've got this virtual field trip. You can go out any time in the month of July. And um, so I took advantage of that. It had been several years since I had been out there and really didn't know the trails. I'll tell you, they have a really, really nice little uh, map showing the different trails. And I really had a good time. So I'll be joining you and maybe others who are on that uh, gathering to talk about that Bath Nature Preserve uh, and that scrapbook. That was fun. Yeah, yeah. All righty. Uh, Gloria, Gloria Ferris, she will speak about uh, some urban birding, Bird of the Month fundraiser, photography contest. So take it away, Gloria. Okay. So um, thanks, Nancy. Um, the urban birding update that I have, I have two things to talk about. Um, we are starting an advisory network that we are calling um, Guardians of Nature. And we'd like all of you who think that sounds kind of interesting uh, to join us. Our next meeting will be Thursday, August 27th at 7 p.m. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're building a network of people dedicated to birds and habitat conservation. This boots on the ground volunteer and environmental activist community energizes Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society with ideas, new conversations, projects, and initiatives. Join the group of these like minded individuals who strive to protect bird species and preserve our natural areas. You'll be able to go on our website, wcaudubon.org, and see what volunteer opportunities are there. And um, so again, we'd love to see you join us on our virtual meeting um, Thursday, August 27th at 7 p.m. The second thing I want to uh, inform you about is that for one of our fundraising efforts, we have uh, put together a calendar of 12 birds. And this fundraiser and combination photography contest begins next Sunday on August 9th. We're going to launch a monthly series that will feature a bird a month. August bird is a red-winged blackbird. Not only can you donate 
to WCAS so that we can continue offering our online programs to bring information to you and the public, making conservation an integral part of information to you and the public. <laughs> um, of our lives going forward, but you can enter a monthly photography contest, enter one of your better photographs of a red winged blackbird, and um, we're going to have a friendly competition that will have incentive, incentives and prizes, and check out the events on our WCAS Facebook page, or again, check the, for the rules of the photography contest on our website. You also can go directly to our website and you will be able to donate to the bird of the month. And it'll have the different uh, designations for a uh, contribution. And any contribution that you feel you can give, uh, we will appreciate it. We're hoping that people start thinking, oh, well, what's my favorite bird? Did they choose my favorite bird? And when we come up with something that they really like, they will feel comfortable in donating to our conservation project. So once again, that's our update for urban birding. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, thanks, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Gloria. And remember, look at that picture, that red, red tailed hawk there. That's Gloria. She's glaring at you. She's like, <laughs> damn, damn. <laughs> um, just, just a little housekeeping. For those who may not have muted themselves, please remember to do so. Uh, we do hear some background noise. And so, um, uh, you know, again, just, just remember to, to do that, please. Uh, Amanda Swarovski uh, has a couple of announcements uh, regarding the Chimney Swift uh, Towers and some other things, too. Uh, Amanda. Thanks. Uh, well, COVID-19 slowed everything down for us, just like with everything else. But um, there was one accomplishment. Justin Derecki um, uh, made a tower, a really nice one, uh, for his Eagle Scout project, and it was placed at Mentor Lagoons. Um, and it was sponsored in part by Kirtland Bird Club, WCAS, and Northeastern Ohio Chimney Swift Conservation. Um, so if anyone gets out there, have a look at it. It's, we had pictures of it and did a really great job. Um, we like to sponsor these towers, uh, the, the uh, scouts, almost always, or they always do a great job. So uh, if anyone knows of any towers that need sponsorship and are going to be placed on public land, uh, please get back to WCAS and um, maybe we can help them out. Um, currently, we're doing maintenance um, as soon as we can get it arranged with the, the, the park people um, to repair an old tower that's at Old Field in South Chagrin Reservation. Um, now that they're letting some things happen in the parks, we might be able to do that in the next month. Uh, it just needs painting and a new cap and a new bottom. So it um, doesn't seem like it's going to be too tough, but I don't want to jinx myself. Uh, uh, I just want everyone to keep an eye out for a fundraiser that we're going to have in October. Um, you can go to the WCAS website and also the Facebook page for Northeastern Ohio Chimney Swift Conservation Society. So um, if anyone can contribute to that in October, that would be great. That's all. Thanks so much, Amanda. Look at that beautiful Chimney Swift photo. Wonderful. Um, just a quick reminder that it is membership renewal time. Uh, for WCAS, our membership actually runs from September 1st through the end of August, August 31st. I know it's kind of a weird way of, of having our, our membership drive. Um, and I think I'm looking at some of the names here, and I think just about everyone's name that I see uh, that are participating has become a member. Maybe you joined during, during our early bird special where, where prices were a little lower. We kept the prices down before popping them up for our, our membership. 
uh, drive for 2000-2001. So please uh, consider a membership. All that money from a, a chapter membership stays within the chapter to help with things like uh, maybe helping with some more chimney swift towers, uh, helping with uh, some, some prizes for bird of the month uh, prize winners, uh, you know, just that, that type of stuff. So again, we, we, we try to be real judicious with our, our funds and use them, again, all locally. But thank you so much. Real quick announcement, uh, next month's program, and can you believe I'm saying September already? I can't believe it, but September 1st, which is the first Tuesday of September, uh, we're going to have a talk by Ryan Trimbath, and his talk is on the uh, hybrid cerulean warbler, northern perula warbler that was uh, located in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park a couple years ago. And he may have a little bit of update as to, you know, did the birds come back uh, this year? Were the, high, were the, were the young uh, hybridized uh, birds, did they return? Uh, so um, stay tuned. We hope you can join us again Tuesday, September 1st, 7.30, right here online. Uh, so we hope that you can do that. But this evening, I know you're all here to hear Corey Ringle. Corey is a member of Friends of Pearl Halaka, uh, the former Girl Scout camp. And you know, uh, in, in all my different people I know, uh, people have said, oh, I remember when I was at that Scout camp. Uh, oh, I remember Pearl Halaka as, 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 as when I was a Scout. So there were a lot of people that were touched by that, uh, that area. And, and utilize. Um, and I'm sure Corey will let us know, you know why it came into the hands of the people of Richfield and there were a lot of partnerships that uh, made the purchase or the uh, acquisition of that land for everybody to use so special. So so let's give a warm welcome to Corey Wing. Corey. In Summit County, Ohio, in Richfield Township to be exact, is a large parcel of beautiful land, 336 acres, that was closed off with the surrounding community for over half a century. <laughs> and then in 2011, it became the subject of quite a bit of controversy. The name of the land is Pearl Hyleka, and the reason it was sealed off is because it was a Girl Scout camp. It was an ordinary camp. The Girl Scouts had a large, uh, had bought the land from an inventor who left some unique structures on the property that were about to become legendary. Some of them included a mill that guarded an entrance to a There you go. Uh, a trunk cross mill pond spillway, a dance hall built on streetcar springs so that it would bounce as you danced across it, a beautiful, elegant Adirondack and Normandy style homes girls who weren't quite ready to rough it. Oh, and My notes are on a separate screen. Um, and then 20 years later, uh, they were able to buy a, a, an adjacent estate, uh, the Neal Homes. Including North House. But unfortunately, in 2011, the National Girl Scout Organization changed their program so there'd be less emphasis on the outdoors and more of an emphasis on uh, financial uh, responsibility and fiscal planning. So that's when we came in. Um, oh, goodness gracious. In 2011, the Friends of Fall High Lake uh, formed when they first heard the park was going to be, if the camp was going to be closed. And we started researching the history just to get more familiar with all the history and the natural elements that were at the park. And that brings us to now. Hello, my name is Corey Ringel. I'm the president of Friends of Crawhaleka, and I'm here to tell you that story. I'm also toggling a lot between my notes and PowerPoint, so, so bear with me. All right, our story starts in 1768 with a little girl named Mary Elizabeth 
uh, Carter. Now, this is not her. This is a picture of a little girl. But, um, uh, you know, close your eyes and imagine that this is Mary Elizabeth Carter. So her dad decides they want to get a fresh start in the wilderness. And so they pack up uh, Mary Elizabeth and their five children that were still at home, as well as two other families, and they set out for the Susquehanna Valley in Pennsylvania. And they travel 120 miles and they start to set up their cabin. Ooh. I went down the, I know it's not on the cover. Also not their cabin, but just to keep the story alive. Um, so they, they start uh, clearing the land to set up a cabin and one day the men go to uh, finish building their uh, second and third cabins for the other families and the women go out and order to pick corn and while they're out there, Mary Elizabeth sees uh, some Native Americans and they're dressed in their wear, uh, war paint. And she witnesses her mother and all the other adults that were in their party get murdered. Um, and they were able to run for a little bit, but they did, they got caught, and they were held captive by the local um, uh, Native Americans. Uh, the, uh, they marched them off back to their camp, all the children, and they went back and they murdered all the um, husband's fathers that were back uh, building the cabin. Uh, so they were marched all the way from uh, the Susquehanna Valley all the way up to Fort Niagara. And uh, they spent the winter with uh, with uh, the natives in their camp. And I mean, my goodness, it was it was horrible. Uh, her sister Sarah and her were completely traumatized. Their brother Nathaniel kind of liked the adventuresome lifestyle, so uh, he seemed to to enjoy it. And uh, even once they got up to Fort Niagara, eventually, when the girls were um, uh, auctioned back off, you know, uh, they traded them back to their families and eventually would be returned to Cornwall, Connecticut. The brother refused to leave. Nathaniel asked to stay and his captors loved him so much, they kept him. So, now we're moving on in time. Five years after she comes home, uh, she gets married and she marries Benjamin Oviatt. Uh, they go on to have 11 children that make it to adulthood and all the while they're hearing their mother regaled their stories of her childhood. And we know these stories were regaled over and over again because um, they would go on to tell their grandchildren and the grandchildren would write it down and we can find these stories in multiple history books at local historical societies. So, you grow up. You're constantly being told by your um, mother how dangerous it is to go west. So what does your eldest son, Heman Ovia, decide to do? Move to disputed uh, Native American territory. What else? Go against mom. Um, you know what? I'm going to just check real quick. I see there's a few chats, and I just want to make sure I'm not missing any questions. Well, I'm not going to worry about it. Um, all right. So that brings us to Heenan. Um, in 1880, at the age of 25, Heeman packed up his wife and their two children, and they moved to Ovia, uh, excuse me, they moved to Ohio, uh, into an area called Hudson. And um, there's not very many other settlers out that way, um, but there are a lot of um, Native Americans, and so uh, they decide to set up a trading post. And uh, they do a great job. Um, his wife goes on to learn uh, three different languages. He gets fluent in three of the um, Native American languages. And even when uh, Heeman would go off on some of his business trips in order to order more supplies, she would stay back and watch the uh, shop. And uh, she developed such a reputation of, of um, camaraderie, even when uh, some of the local uh, Native Americans were accused of killing one of the settlers, uh, she rode a horse all the way to Warren, from Hudson to Warren, and that day on a horse, uh, 60 miles, in order to uh, be a witness to, to exonerate them. And they were. She was successful at saving them. Right. So moving on, a little bit of a brief history update to Tecumseh. So um, uh, as you guys know, Tecumseh uh, rose up to unite the tribes in order to uh, prepare them to take back their land. Um, and in 1809, 1809, the Connecticut Land Company folded. Too many people were afraid to settle in Northeast Ohio um, for it to be profitable. And in 1810, one of the investors who bought a share in Richfield Township decided to let it go before any kind of battle was on their doorstep. So to cut his uh, losses, he put the land up for cheap. And, and um, 
that would be a uh, $1.25 an anchor. And just to give you guys some comparisons, um, in Hudson, land was going for a do uh, $4 an acre, and Youngstown, much more civilized, $5 an acre. So you might think, hey, it's a business deal, $1.25, why not buy up as much land as possible? But you wouldn't buy up land in a war-torn nation. Um, so, so anyways, not only did he believe that he could settle there just fine, but he, he believed it so much he invited his remaining uh, family. Out of the ten siblings, nine decided to come out to Ohio and join him. Um, so hence their huge involvement uh, in the Richfield area. And then uh, the tensions with the natives came to a head when uh, the Indians decided to uh, side with the British in the War of 1812, which they lost, and um, those who wanted to return to their homes weren't allowed to. Um, so that's the story of how the Oviat came to settle the area. All right, so. That brings us uh, uh, to, to a little bit of a map. Um, are you guys able to see my my pointer on the screen? Well, I hope you can. Um, yes, yeah, I can see I it. I hope others can. Thank you for chiming in. All right, so Heeman's brother Nathaniel arrived in 1811 and bar bought a large parcel of land on both sides of, of Broadview Road. So just to get everyone oriented, this is Broadview Road on the diagonal across here. And anyone familiar with Richfield knows it comes down to um, the corner of 303 in Broadview, and 303 is across the bottom here. And so we're kind of on the corner, minus the fact there's a big chunk of land missing, but we kind of hug the corner. So um, on this side of Broadview Road, uh, Heeman's brother Nathaniel uh, came to, to um, farm that area, and he allowed his daughter Ruth and her husband to farm the land. Um, so they kind of started to settle this area. And that's going to come back. So remember Ruth Oviatt. Um, uh, here's a picture of their farm. You'll also recognize this barn in the background there. It is still kind of there, just a little bit remodeled. Uh, so this is an etching that was found in an atlas in 1874. And they were pretty prosperous. Some general farming, mostly dairy and sheep. Um, and they had a beautiful gate post that was carved with an MRF from Milton Rufus Freeman, um, her husband. Uh, and now that's a giant eagle in that area, but we'll come back to that. And then on the other side of the land was Mason. Um, he was the son of uh, Salmon and Salmon Oviatt and Mary Humphrey. Um, and he was one of the 11 children that came out that way. Uh, and he settled this uh, end of the park. Right. Uh, here's a picture of the Oviatt house that is still on the property to this day. Um, he, Mason built the house with his wife Fanny in 1836, and they sawed all the boards on site using a Danza plate that will come back later on. All right. Uh, now, Heeman Oviatt, great uncle Heeman, who first came and settled the land, uh, he was a devout Christian, correct? philanthropist, and he was also an abolitionist, which takes us to which takes us to John Brown. So in 1840, Heeman Oviat hired abolitionist John Brown to work for him. And uh, John Brown got Mason involved in the Underground Railroad. So he uh, gave Mason a, uh, a horse cart, but it had a false bottom on it. So you could hide uh, slaves underneath, escaping slaves, and um, cover it with hay. And uh, that way they could smuggle them out to Oviat. And there's a beautiful story that was recorded by one of the local townspeople. So if you're ever really interested in following up on it, it's, it's a really cool story. Um, uh, Heeman, or excuse me, Mason Oviatt ended up getting caught up in the gold rush in 1850, and he set out for California, but unfortunately died in, in route, and um, they ended up bringing him back, and he's buried in Richfield. All right. And then um, his wife, Fanny, she never remarried. She raised the kids and ran the farm by herself, and a couple years after her death, she gave the title over to her brother um, at the adjoining farm, who eventually passed it on to his kids, or her great 
uh, niece. And um, here they are. But eventually they are ready to sell, uh, and that's when Mr. Kirby comes into the picture. So in 1919, uh, Ray and uh, Mimi Oviat sold their 100-acre farm to inventor Jim Kirby. And at the time he was leading a wonderful life, he was living in Cleveland and he had just invented the spin cycle washing machine. So up until then, you were scrubbing and then pretending you're floating through a ringer, you know, the two loops and draining it. And uh, he created it, so it was in a spinning device and would expel the water so you didn't have to deal with that stupid ringer. Uh, so he was living the good life. And uh, over time, he would amass over 160 patents. Uh, most of them were to eliminate the drudgery of housework, which includes the vacuum cleaner, the washing machine, and then uh, additions to those uh, inventions. Um, but he, he was ready to move out to um, a park life, and so here he is uh, checking out the Oviat farm. Uh, there is a waterfall on the property, and we thought this picture was just so charming because look at how much fun he ha is having sliding down the waterfall. But black and white photography uh, probably wouldn't allow for, for a quick picture like that. So we think Mr. Kirby may be playing a prank where he just uh, lays on his back like a little upturned bug and pretends like he went for a slide. Um, so he was quite busy. So. Um, one of his ideas was to build a self-clarifying lake. And uh, here's a picture of the dam that he proposed. I'm going to try and stay in shot and show you. When it's raining or snow is melting and water is coming off the hillside, it's picking up sediment. And it enters into the springs uh, and the streams and so forth, and it comes down and enters into your lake eventually. And he put in a floodgate um, with the idea being uh, when the water was high, float valves would rise and it would open a trap door. Let me get that on the screen here. Here's that trap door below. Usually the water comes out here when it's nice and clean, but this valve would float up and close the door and then water would raise and go down this trap door and uh, redirect the water under the lake and back out the other side. Hence, eliminate the drudgery in his own personal life. All right. Um, once he got his lake built, he decided to start clearing the fields, except for a beautiful oak tree, which is still there, um, and build up his Adirondack-style home. Uh, he even had the luxury of having air conditioning, where he redirected water from a nearby spring over the roof to help cool it in the summertime. Very clever guy. But he's an inventor, and the one thing you need is electricity to be an inventor. Uh, but unfortunately, Richfield didn't have electricity just yet. So he built a hydroelectric water wheel to generate electricity for his invention. Now, by this time, it was very popular to be using a turbine, so the overshot water wheel is kind of a surprise. But he had a story where he built um, a small model as a child, so it might have been just near and dear to his heart. Um, but he did build this beautiful water wheel, and um, uh, it was used, uh, built upon ball bearings, so even when the water was low, the wheel would still continue to turn evenly, um, so that you'd have good, solid uh, electricity. Um, and then he had a beautiful garden. Um, he worked with a gardener to bring in plants from all over, and, and here's a view of the, the back side of the house with the chimney. And if you ever get the chance to visit the park, You'll, you'll have to look closely at the chimney because the mason carved out the numbers 1921 and it's, it's in the chimney. Uh, it's a little discreet, but it's, it's a pretty cool, pretty cool detail. But he was pretty, um, uh, he was a hard worker. And just to give a, a scale of how hard working he was, uh, year one, he moved to the farm and, uh, you know, that's 100 acres. <laughs> Um, year two, he uh, uh, built a uh, tanning dam and started construction on the house. Year three, he finished the house. Year four, he buys the two adjacent farms and builds the mill. Year five, he builds a dance hall on springs in order to host different members of um, his office to come out for picnics and members of the community. And year six, he builds a dam for an upper lake. So he was just one thing after another. 
And all that time, he added another 18 more patents to the 40 he already had at the time. So um, it wasn't like he got 40 done, took a pause, and then kept going after he retired. I mean, he, he was inventing and building and was nonstop. Um, excuse me, my computer seems to have frozen. Oh, goodness gracious. Betsy, are you able to hear me? Am I frozen everywhere? I can hear you. It's not a problem. I can hear you. It's not a problem. Okay. Everyone, I apologize. My my PowerPoint has frozen. Um, I may have to uh, turn off and restart. I'm, uh, I apologize. Technology has gotten the better of me. It may just take a moment to catch up. Okay. Well, the good news is we made it halfway, so that's huge. <laughs> well, while Corey is working with that, and as soon as we see the screen change again, just wanted to, to uh, again, chat up the, the, the area. It's uh, it's really beautiful. Um, the houses on the property are are lovely. Um, I, I was not able to go into the bounce house. That was that would have been so much fun. The the house that uh, where the floor is built on springs where they would do dances. Uh, but that that it's it's really beautiful. Uh, very hilly. Um, again, you can uh, enter it off of Broadview Road. And you do see some evidence of the of the Girl Scout camp, but also again the the Kirby, uh, all the Kirby inventions, or a lot of the Kirby inventions are around as well too. I, I believe Western Cuyahoga did some bird surveys, so if uh, I don't know, um, I think Marianne and Tom Romito were part of that, and there may have been a few others. Uh, so again, we're we're. Coming up with a you know a list of birds that use the uh, the piece of property. Aha! Looks as though. Well, our, up, did you guys get in? Looks as though the PowerPoint has moved to another slide. Uh oh. We don't like to hear uh oh. Are you guys looking at a new picture? Yes, we are. Oh, well, first of all, Nancy, thank you for that beautiful commercial break. It was just what I needed. <laughs> yep. Um, all right. Well, picking up where we left off, he was very, um, he was a busy beaver. So as things started to slow down on construction, he went back to his invention. And based on the number of patents, 62 in 15 years, the most productive time of his life was spent from 1922 to 1936, which is while, while the mill was his workshop and he was at the property. Um, he was a big believer in staying ahead of the competition. No matter how awesome the accomplishment, if you're stagnant, you will be overtaken. So he was, he was pretty good. But the thing he loved to do the most was to recharge his energy by being on the water. And so he loved to fish. He loved to boat. Here's him on a little stand-up paddleboard he built for himself. Um, but the original six-acre lake was not large enough, and he wanted to build another larger lake. And that brings us to his neighbor to the north, the Neal family. So pictured here, uh, left to right, is Bill. Um, uh, and then... Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, CJ, and then William. And they are on the pony uh, named Regret, and the horse's name is Indian. 
Uh, I would not want to be that pony. But uh, they were still on Broadview Road, where I pointed out where Ruth Oviatt was set up. And uh, they had moved in to a renovated house, uh, and they were just up there farming. So let me back up. Mr. Neal owned a moving and storage company, and anyone who's in the Lakewood area may remember Neal Moving and Storage. Um, but he liked to go out and play golf and relax, and that didn't really leave much time to be uh, at home with his wife helping raise the boys. And when they were young, that was okay. But as they got older, Mrs. Neal was not a fan of that. And so she wanted him to find a hobby that he could do with the kids. Hence them coming to Richfield and buying a hobby farm. And in the beginning, they started off with a variety of things. But in the end, they, they loved planting apple trees. And so they really put all their effort onto that. Now, they did go into the area um, just north of Kirby, uh, Kirby's property. Uh, here's a picture of them uh, cross-country skiing, but on their adventure they were checking in on the apple trees and their irrigation dam that's up that way. But as I mentioned, Kirby wanted to come in and um, as he was heading north, he noticed they had a beautiful valley, just perfect for flooding, and it would be large enough that he could have a bigger lake. So when he talked them into uh, flooding the valley, they decided, oh, this is too beautiful to pass up. We're going to build a house overlooking that lake. Uh, this is around the time that uh, Tower City was being built, and uh, or excuse me, the Terminal Tower. And a lot of the original buildings were being taken down that were on the square. And so they were free, open to anybody who could haul them away. And who else better to do that than someone who owns a moving and storage company? So he brought a whole bunch of the bricks down there, and that's what they built their beautiful homes out of. They also built a, um, a little uh, garage and a caretaker above so that when they weren't at the property, someone could be there to maintain the apple trees. This is inside um, uh, their home on the lake, which would eventually be called North House. And it looks like the uh, overturned hull of a boat. And you'll see there's a picture of a Mayflower all at the very end. And we really don't know all the details of that, uh, but we know they like to travel. And um, we know that Mrs. Neal's parents were from Germany, so maybe it had something to do with uh, their interest in, in um, traveling. He did eventually merge his company with Mayflower Moving and Storage, so maybe it has something to do with that. We're still researching. Um, so here is Mr. and Mrs. Neal uh, enjoying the terrace at North House overlooking, overlooking their brand new lake. But the uh, house up above did not go to waste. Uh, they converted it into a cider uh, processing plant. So it was uh, a fruit stand up front, and then in the back, that original barn I was telling you about, they had a few renovations to it, but that's where their cider press was. And over the years, it's become a lot of things. It had a bowling alley in at one point, and then it became another grocery store, country counter, and now it's the little, we call it a giant eaglet. It's the baby giant eagle. Um, here's a picture of their uh, their signage in front of the store. Um, eventually, their eldest boy uh, got married in 1935, and as a wedding present, his parents built him a house just to the south of them that's now named Amity House. So. If you, if you got a toaster oven as, as a wedding gift, never settle, never settle, go for the house. Uh, but it's a beautiful house, very detailed. Um, and when they moved in there, uh, or while they were building it, they wanted to bring some of the old house with them. And here is the hitching post that was in front of the original one. The M has been removed, or you know, chipped away, uh, but you can still see uh, the 1867 when they built it and so forth. All right. Um, unfortunately, in 1936, oh, excuse me, in 1936, Herbert and his wife Helen had a baby girl, um, and here's Barbara pictured in Amity living room. But the day before Barbara was born, unfortunately her grandfather, Mr. Neal, was out inspecting his apple trees, and that's where the workers found his bodies, and they wonder his beloved trees the next day, they think that he might have had um, a heart attack. And that threw all the responsibilities of the Neal business and farm onto the eldest boy, uh, which was a lot of responsibility. But he did pretty good. Here's a picture of him uh, enjoying the tennis courts and going fishing with his, his little daughter, Barbara, a little bit older. 
Um, but unfortunately, after a while, they would start to have uh, some crop failures. And um, it was a lot to keep up with, and they were selling off all these different parcels in order to do whatever they could to uh, maintain the, the two homes that they had on the property. Uh, but they, they did notice all the while um, they kept seeing the Girl Scouts uh, just to the south. Uh, Kirby's property was half the lake, and they were half the lake, so they'd see the Girl Scouts enjoying canoeing and swimming and so forth, and they thought, gosh, who else better to sell to than those Girl Scouts? All right. So as I said, Kirby had already sold his estate to the Girl Scouts in 1937, and actually he didn't move that far away. He moved just up the road a few doors down and built yet another lake. The man had a theme. Um, uh, at this point, the Girl Scouts were only 25 years old. Uh, the Cleveland Girl Scout Council had been looking for a place for a permanent summer camp for over 15 years, and they had been using borrowed farmland to set up their camps, but they really wanted a place of their own. And the main thing they were looking for was a good swimming lake, um, something for, for boating and, and all their adventures. Uh, real estate agents would take them to farm after farm and tell them they could easily dam up a portion of it and build their own lake. Um, but boy, that seemed like a lot of work. Uh, one woman on the camp committee remembered how they had to keep calling the barbed bar wire fences to see yet another dry field. But when they finally saw the Kirby land, they knew they had crawled under their last barbed wire fence. Um, not only did it have a great lake, but it had a second lake, and there were two buildings that had big fireplaces, his home and the dance hall, and uh, girls would be able to camp there year-round. Um, and so even though America was still in the grips of the Depression, they raised $60,000 um, that they needed in only two weeks. Uh, families contributed, businesses donated, even the girl, girls themselves went out and uh, collected their dimes and nickels in order to purchase the camp. Um, in 1937, Garfield Hall, the dance hall, uh, became the dining hall, and they put a kitchen on the back in order to accommodate them. Uh, they had a summer camp where girls would stay a week or two at a time, but the biggest use of the camp was year-round weekend rentals, where individual troops would go out and, and use the camp. Uh, and they would go on to build a few more uh, sites, Hilltop Cabin, Sealy Cabin, anyone familiar might recognize those names. Uh, and then on top of those small little cabins, they would set up these platform tents. They were almost like um, little decks raised off the ground with cots, and then you can see the canvas was pulled over it um, in order to protect the girls from the rain and the elements. And then another very popular feature was the uh, Browning Nest, uh, kind of near Kirby House, a little bit up the hillside. They found a nice big tree, and they were able to uh, uh, place the girls up in it, or you know, put a little tree house up there. Um, in 1957, after that catastrophic crop failure, uh, the Neals were ready to sell their home, and they sold them to the Girl Scouts. So now they have three beautiful homes, uh, Garfield Hall, the Dining Hall, I mean, this was really shaping up to be quite, quite a premier campsite. Um, they decided, hey, this could maybe even be uh, like an international camp. So uh, the Girl Scouts have like My Chalet or My Cabana in, in um, Mexico. There's little um, international places all over, and they wanted to see maybe this could even be one of those hosting camps to bring people uh, in. Um, so in uh, 1965, they did, uh, built a road out to the Broadview entrance, and then in 1967, they had a big campaign. Um, they built Gun Hall, the main dining hall you might have seen when you first come into the park, the boathouse, and the pool, and the pool house. Uh, unfortunately, in the mid-70s, there were some security issues around children's camps, and so they installed an eight-foot-high barbed wire fence around the entire property um, to protect the kids. So it was already pretty closed off and difficult to get to. You could only go there if you were a Girl Scout, and then that really made it closed off. And then in the 90s, they started a very popular um, uh, bridal program, and they almost divided the camp in half. There's a, 
a stream that runs down the middle of it, and on the west side there's the uh, horse barns and the riding rings and the bridal trails, and then the adventure camp was on the east side, and um, I mean, we would mingle, but uh, it, it just kind of made it your own special place. So the, the horse program was very popular. Um, but uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, in 2011, the Girl Scouts were starting to change their program. And we started working with Western Reserve Land Conservancy in order to um, see what we could do to protect the land. And it was kind of amazing. Uh, they came in and they were looking around and they couldn't stop commenting on how beautiful the understory was. That it wasn't picked over like the metro parks. And at first us Girl Scouts were pretty proud of ourselves. It's just because we're so amazing. Uh, but eventually we learned it really helps to have an eight-foot fence around your, your property because it keeps the deer out. I mean, of course they can jump it, no big deal, but it, it kind of prevents the casual browse. And so it kind of inadvertently not only protected the girls from strangers, but it also protected our natural resources from getting pillaged by deer. Um, so uh, we, uh, Friends of Crawl High Lake and Western Reserve Land Conservancy, we reached out to um, Richfield Village and Richfield Township are two separate entities, and we wanted to see if either of them would be interested in, in purchasing this beautiful piece of land. And uh, unfortunately, both of them didn't have the tax base. But if they work together, then the village and the township could form a new district, a joint recreation district, and that district would be large enough. And in 2014, it went on the ballot, and it, it won. It won the first try. And, um, uh, it, was, it was a miracle. It was, it was amazing. Um, it took a lot of hard work, but we convinced the community through multiple open houses uh, to come explore Ohio's hidden treasure because no one had seen it for almost 75 years. It was hidden, and the only people who got to use it were Girl Scouts. And how amazing is it now that it's open to everyone to use? Every day since, uh, well, it was purchased in 2015 after the 2014 election in November. Uh, but dawn to dusk, anyone can come out and enjoy it and picnic. So now, us moving forward, things that we've learned. Um, we, we do just love that mill, and so we've been working on starting the history there and preserving it. But we don't just work on preserving the history, uh, we want to be well-rounded. Um, so we have uh, our focuses are conservation, recreation, education, and history. And um, in our top corner here, we have our invasive species management team going out and picking garlic mustard and barberry and Japanese knotweed and goodness, the list just goes on and on. And in the bottom corner, uh, we have the native plant restoration team going in and in that now vacuum space that was created by removing the bad guys, we're planting swamp, um, uh, swamp milkweed and um, purple coneflower and black-eyed Susans and um, Gosh, the list goes on and on. And the hope is to create some diversity in the plant life, which might then increase the diversity in our bugs, which then might make us more diverse in birds. Um, so that's our conservation efforts and education efforts. And then um, on top of that, our recreation and education efforts are some, some guided hikes. Um, I'm getting so lost my mouse. Um, As you can see uh, at the top here, we oh there we are. Uh, we had, uh, got to work with a lot of organizations, but uh, one that we really enjoyed was having the Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society out to give a beautiful presentation about the kinds of birds you can find at the park. And we have a lot of different. We have two lakes, and some of them have fields right next to them, and some of them have forests right up to them, and some of them have swamps and wetlands right up to them, and all those different uh, areas um, connecting and touching with each other uh, allows for some kind of interesting bird viewing. Um, so just a few, but you know, I'm sure you guys seeing avid birders see these things all the time with cardinals and woodpeckers and lots of waterfowl and ducks and geese. Um, but our big excitement, uh, as, as Nancy mentioned, we had a couple Christmas bird counts. And I can recall that the very first one, 
uh, I was saying that, oh, uh, we have a bald eagle on the lake. And I, I'm not sure they quite believed me when I first said it. Um, and I, I was pretty excited because as we were standing at the top of the hill overlooking the um, lower lake, I was trying to describe where it was, and it lived in this one tree, and it really enjoyed this one particular branch, but it hadn't built a nest yet. And who comes swooping in but our friend the bald eagle? And boy, were we excited to. He came at perfect timing so I could say, no, look, he does live here. Um, he's up here in this little tree. This is the dead branch he enjoyed hanging out on. But we have him zoomed in once so you can see him. Um, and uh, him and his uh, uh, girlfriend uh, set up a nest in a tree, and it was pretty exciting. They came for two summers, and um, it was just kind of fun because you could uh, you could see what they were eating. They would drop it below them, and um, it was just kind of interesting to see them up close. But we did have some responsibilities with the ODNR to fix the dam, and that involved some construction coming in, and they tried to get distance, but the birds decided to move on somewhere else. But fear not, new friends came in, and that's when this gentleman came to visit. Uh, this is a little owl who moved into their nest, and they had babies. Unfortunately, you can't see them in this view in the nest, but again, on that same hillside, you can go up and you can look down, and the tree is pretty tall. You can look level with it, and you can see them popping their little heads over the edge every so often. Um, so that brings us, uh, goodness, I talked a lot faster than I thought, but the good news is we have lots of time for questions. Um, moving forward, uh, how, to, how to get involved. Uh, so, so something we're pretty proud of is we just got listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And we gave this whole history spiel, how we're connected to people moving out and, and um, settling Richfield, how we have an inventor there, how we have these beautiful old homes and the farmers that were very involved. And the uh, Department of Interior wasn't interested. They said everyone has inventors. Everybody has old homes. Everyone has pioneers. You know what makes you guys special? The Girl Scout history. You had thousands of girls out there during a very formative time in their life, during a very pivotal moment of the right to vote and getting involved in the workplace, and them coming out to camp and learning leadership skills and, and how to be an individual. Those are the stories we're collecting. And it thanks to hundreds of Girl Scouts uh, camp alumni writing in about their experiences, uh, we were able to submit that and get listed on the National Register. And we're still collecting those stories. So um, if you have some stories, if you have some artifacts or treasures from your childhood when you might have been at the, the camp, we, we'd love to hear your stories and scan your pictures and give them back to you, uh, take pictures of your artifacts or you know, give them to our museum. Um, get involved and become a member, tell your friends and family about us, and, and really the best thing you can do is come out and hike at the park. Um, the more people we have out there, it prevents vandalism and it gets people excited. Um, I know we have a few birders that go out there and they'll point things out to people, although they'll say, hey, I saw this down on the bottom end of the lake, and it, it really draws out a lot of excitement. So. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, close the PowerPoint and, and return, um, but I'd, I'd love to hear any questions people may have. All righty, thank you so much, Corey. Um, I've asked for people to either post their question in the chat, and I can um, post it to you. Or if people want to unmute, now it is time to unmute, and you can ask questions. I'm going to start out with a question, if you wouldn't mind, Corey. Um, you said become a member. So is there like a Friends of Coral Hawka um, membership? We do have one uh, to show your enthusiasm for the park. Uh, we have a $20 membership. And um, oh, goodness, I know it's getting a little slow. Um, we have a $20 membership. If you're interested in becoming a member, we offer discounts and um, we have a few merchandise if you'd like to show your support with a shirt. Um, it, it, it's very helpful because the membership dues go a long way towards restoring some of the historic homes and putting in new um, uh, part of the native plant restoration plants and so forth. Great. 
Um, a couple questions have come in. Uh, is fishing allowed? It is allowed. Um, they have a catch and release program and they follow a lot of the um, ODNR rules. So when you come to the park, uh, the lower lake right now has been drained because they're working on fixing the dam, uh, which I'd love to talk about actually. But um, uh, that's probably not the best lake to go fishing at. But the upper lake has a big board with instructions of um, what kind of fish are in there that you can look for. And I wish I had a better grasp, not much of an angler. But uh, they have a catch and release program. And Upper Lake, is that the lake that the, um, the uh, mill is on? No, that is actually where the boathouse is. Um, oh, you know, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, a way to remember it, which is a little tricky, the Upper Lake is also known as Lake Linnea, and the lower one is Nell, named after Jim and Nellie Kirby. Uh, but the lower lake is where Mr. Kruger was, and the upper lake is where the, the Neal homes are, closer to Gun Hall. And there's, there's some, and there's some good maps, a map that shows trails and... Yes. Okay. If you want to your visit, you can go to richfieldparishpreserve.org um, or, or to our website. And uh, there's a lot of information uh, about maps and directions and so forth. Okay, great. Uh, another question came in. Um, would there be? Would it be a good site for maybe a chimney swift tower? Uh, I know there's forest there. We have the you know, we have the uh, the lakes and ponds and stuff. Uh, is there some? Are there some open fields and things? Because that's what the Swiss would need is uh, some places for zooming around and so uh, maybe that's a, that's something that we should check out, right, Amanda? <laughs> yeah, so so that's a potential. Yeah. yeah, I was actually there last night with uh, the Cleveland Cleveland Metro Parks, and um, I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> oh, okay. Ah, great minds yeah. working together. <laughs> nice. So winter time, uh, cross country skiing is that a is that something that can be done? Oh, I think Corey might be having some internet issues. Somebody did ask, uh, inquire if it was an eBird hotspot, and I was looking on eBird and I could not find it specifically, but there is a spot called Rising Valley, which is very close, which is actually part of, the, I think, the Hinkley Metro Park. Um, so, yeah, we lost Corey. Oh, no, we lost Corey. Um, but anyhow, um, yeah, so that, uh, if you're out there, make it a birding hotspot. Okay. Um, here's a question. It says, my son volunteers at the park on Saturdays. Now, I camped in the buildings and platform tents as a Girl Scout. The floor on Springs got wild with 50 plus teenagers jumping on it. Oh, I want to do that. Um, uh, it says, at the time, we heard stories that the houses served as a stop on the Underground Railroad. And is that true, Corey? Was it? Am I back by chance? Can you see me again? Yes, you're, you're back. Oh, um, by the way, if anyone is wondering, you know, if technology, as a millennial, I am feeling mostly. So uh, I hope I'm boosting everyone else's confidence. Uh, I heard, uh, was it part of the Underground Railroad? And yes, the Oviat House was part of the Underground Railroad, based on the stories that were passed down. We don't have anything in writing because you really didn't want to have it in writing back in the day. But yeah. we've heard from numerous things that's been recorded uh, in the uh, historical society. Oh, fantastic. Interesting. Very interesting. You also were asking me about those chimney swifts, and I wanted to say, yes, we have a lot of chimneys on the property. All the houses have at least two, if not three, chimneys, and we're constantly seeing them going back and forth between the lake and the homes. 
Okay. So you don't have them have the the chimneys capped off to keep raccoons and stuff like that out. That's my project this Friday. I'm going and doing. Uh, oh. Two birds come in, and it's my job to check every couple of days to make sure no one's trapped inside. And we did try to do a few things, but we're still in the process of. Um, they blow off, and we just need to. I have four that need to be capped this weekend. Mm -hmm. Oh, it would be nice to keep them uncapped for the summer and the summer and the and oh, roosting and you know, allow them to allow them to roost. Or if we can get a if, if maybe a, a, a chimney swift tower can be put out in some of the areas, that might be a potential project. Nancy, Mr. Kirby, Mr. Kirby would approve. <laughs> I bet he would. Uh, perhaps I can reach out to you guys for some educational materials. I know as an architect what I thought would be the best solution, but it sounds like maybe you have some some other ideas that uh, something that collaborates with both our nature and our preservation. Yep. Any other questions? Uh, I'm not seeing any. Uh, Betsy, did you wanna did you wanna say anything? Um, thank you. I'd just like to remind people to go to the website wcaudubon.org and uh, be sure to check out all of the social media channels that we have and the various libraries. We have a huge library on YouTube um, and a very active Facebook page, very active Twitter feed if you're on any of those uh, social channels. Or if you happen to be a photographer and you, say, maintain a photography library on Flickr, we're also there. So uh, please, number one, connect with us wherever you can find us. And number two, be sure to share our content. And we'll see that you do and we'll share your contact, your content back uh, to help, to help um, amplify all of our efforts. If you're not subscribed oh, to the newsletter, uh, please go to the, the website and uh, and do so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, let's thank give uh, Corey a, a, a nice round of applause. Thank you so much, Corey. Uh, appreciate it. And you know, again, this is another place I need to get out to again. Um, and of course, remember, uh, if you're not a member of Western Cuyahoga Audubon, this is the time to join. Uh, again, all funds stay within the within the uh, chapters and use them for good purposes. Uh, lots of stuff going on. We hope that to uh, have you uh, join us next month as well, too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. <laughs>